organists, unlike almost every other kind of musician, rarely own their own instrument. If they do, it's usually an electronic version. When I started learning the organ, aged about 15, this was a real hindrance for me. Churches are cold and damp, and practicing is unpleasant. You know, it was only when I started filming these trips, showing you beautiful English villages, that I realised the true value of playing the church organ. Organs are quirky, unpredictable, noisy, but the music they produce is perhaps more than any other instrument in perfect harmony with nature. I enter a delicate and gentle Victorian church, though its history stretches back much further than that. I'm instantly drawn to the vivid colours of this stained glass window in the chancel, and you'll notice the purple for Lent of the altar. This is an immaculately kept church, a perfect place of shelter. What I love about this particular building is the way that the outside seems to be present in here. I can look out the window and see trees, sunshine, hedgerows, and even a horse grazing in the field next to the churchyard. It's so tranquil. Some history about St Andrew's Church, Nunton. The church was originally a chapel of ease to Downton until the linking of Oddstock with Nunton into a single parish in 1915. It stands on the same site as an earlier church, believed to date from Saxon times. The only remains of this are the pillars of the chancel arch, with what are probably Saxon capitals, the west arch of the chapel and the wall opposite to it. In the east window, St Andrew, to whom the church is dedicated, is seen leaving his fishing to answer the call of Christ, and opposite bringing the boy with his loaves and fishes to the master. Just listen to this. As in every church, there are plaques and monuments, each having its own particular interest, but one tablet to the right of the organ may be deserving of special mention. It commemorates Ernest Charles Frey, who was the organist of this church from 1908 to 1970. 62 years of faithful, devoted service is worthy of remembrance. Well, that final note from the church history leads us perfectly on to the instrument which has served this church for 115 years. 
there's actually a photo here of Mr. Frey playing this organ. Here he is. I wonder what date this picture was taken. I also wonder, if any of you can guess, I can't tell, what the piece he's playing is. Organists, if any of you can zoom in on that photo and, and work it out for me, I'd be fascinated to know. That's the challenge for the week. But until then, here's the organ of St Andrew's Church in Nunton. You'll recognise the builder's name, Sweetland Organ Building Company of Bath, who built last week's organ at Lover Church. And it says here, this organ was provided by subscription with the assistance of a generous contribution by Andrew Carnegie of Skybow Castle in Scotland in 1909. Very stiff doors here. And the latch. Two keyboards, or manuals in organist speak, and a full-size pedal board. So in theory, you could play almost anything on this instrument. So long as it's in tune, we'll find out. These stops on the right-hand side are for the lower keyboard. We have an open diapason. Okay, there's an instant problem. Oh dear. When I pull out the open diapason stop, it triggers a note to stick, which is not much help. So look. An organ isn't supposed to make a sound when you don't play any of the notes. But this one does. So I can feel the wind coming out of that pipe. Oh, the joys of being an organist. Yeah, okay, broadly speaking, that's what we're going to have to do. What else is wrong with this? Maybe we should say what's right with it. So that's the lower keyboard. We have a sticking note, so I'll have to find some way of working around that. In terms of tuning, if I look at the reeds first, they're the first to go out of tune. So it gives you an indication of how long ago the instrument was actually tuned. That's the horn stop. In fact, let me put a microphone at the back of the church so you can hear all of these sounds properly. Remember Ben's law of microphone placement as far away from the organ console as you can, because the blowers are really loud. The blower is what supplies wind to power the organ. Because it's electrified, it obviously makes some sound. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear the beautiful sound of the pipes, and maybe some bird song outside. That's fine, but I don't want to hear the blower. And I certainly don't want to hear my fingers and my feet knocking against the keys and the pedals. So I'm here at the back of the nave with the microphone According to the microphone, this is my 63rd recording that I've made in the last couple of weeks. Okay, back to the organ. I love this bit. Even when the organs don't work, I'm used to it. Through the vestry, around the organ, you can hear the blower again, through the curtain. I don't understand why this organ has um, big wooden doors, because they knock against the pipework, which is not fair on these pipes. It probably doesn't help them with the tuning if the wood is bashed against the pipes. But it's not my, not my business to comment. Um, right, okay, so let's start with the horn sound. Most prone to going out of tune, the reeds. And you can tell it is out of tune. That's fine, it's February. I just won't use it. Working my way up, say the open diapason works, Add to that the principal. These are the two most reliable stops, the least likely to go out of tune. 
add the 15th, which is a much brighter sound. Again, difficult to work with. The higher the note you play, the more likely the organ will sound out of tune. For that reason, I prefer playing Baroque music on out-of-tune village church organs. The Baroque period was about 1600 to 1750. Instruments didn't have a large range, so the music doesn't tend to go very high. Also, Bach's music is just so consistently good that it doesn't really matter how in tune the organ is anyway. Come back to that later. So for now, on first inspection, this is an out-of-tune organ, but we have to work with that. That's what we do when we play in village churches. The aim of the game and the aim of this channel is to make these instruments sound beautiful, and they do. So, I must say, a good range of stops to make this organ very versatile. The only hindrance, as far as expressiveness is concerned, is that the swell pedal isn't a balanced one. A balanced swell pedal allows you to open and close the swell box as much or as little as you like, gradually, to make the organ get louder and softer by increments. However, this is what we call a ratchet swell. It's basically either open or closed. You can graduate between the two, but it's really hard to do with your foot. And it makes a lot of noise as well, rather clunky. Once again, that points towards Baroque music being the best for this instrument. Because Baroque music tends to have what we call terraced dynamics, either loud or soft. Like echoes, if you like. So, with the crows making a rumpus in the trees outside, let's begin my favourite part of these videos, a miniature recital based on the liturgical season and the musical instrument which I'm presented with. So, we're in the season of Lent, and this organ is out of tune. Where does that lead me? Towards the greatest composer of music for the season, Johann Sebastian Bach, of course. If you have an organ that's out of tune, he is the composer I would recommend most. Bach's music is so consistently beautiful in its construction that it's almost as if it's a product of nature itself. Bach was a prolific writer of music for the church organ. He wrote books of pieces called chorale preludes, organ pieces based on old hymn tunes or chorales. One of my favourites, and one of the most famous ever composed by Bach, is called Ich ruf zu dir, Herr Jesu Christ, which means, I call to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's not specifically composed for the season of Lent, but its character, its solemn mood and gravitas is just perfect for it.
Ikurufsu Deer, Herr Jesu Christ, one of J.S. Bach's most moving chorale preludes. Now we turn to hymns. One of my favourites for the season of Lent is Jesu Lover of My Soul, to the tune Aberystwyth, composed by Joseph Parry. Let me read you some of the amazing poetry from this hymn. Where are we? Ah, hymn book. Let's find a spot to sit down. Number 96. Jesu, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. Hide me, O my saviour, hide, till the storm of life is past. Safe into the haven guide, O receive my soul at last. Jesu, lover of my soul, one of the most imposing and grand hymns for the season of Lent. Now I turn to my final offering on this sunny afternoon here at Nunton. Ever since starting these road trips, there's one single piece I've always wanted to play, but I've never been able to, because none of the instruments have really lent themselves to it. This is one of the most beautiful and evocative pieces of English music ever composed. It has so much resonance for people, all in different ways. It's called Nimrod, and it's composed by Edward Elgar. It's used worldwide, but most notably here in England, where it's performed at remembrance services. 
Now we clearly have tuning issues, sticking notes, all kinds of problems, which mean I have to change the arrangement slightly. I have to play notes at a different octave. I have to avoid certain notes. Some of the higher passages may sound out of tune, but aren't those imperfections where the beauty of music lies? Just as in nature, the irregularities, if everything was perfect, there would be no emotion. So, while I'm playing this piece, you might like to call to mind somebody that you've loved and lost. And in that sense, may this performance be dedicated to them.
Elgar's Nimrod. And it constantly amazes me that I can reproduce the sound of a tiny church organ in homes all over the world. I hope you enjoyed that, but more so, I hope that it had some kind of emotional resonance for you wherever you are. That would be fantastic. I like to keep these videos available for everybody to view so that I can gain an audience on YouTube. So with that in mind, I'm reliant entirely on donations at this stage. So if you enjoyed this film, feel free to click on the link below the video, which takes you to my PayPal donations page. Wow, this village keeps getting better and better. Anyway, if you click on the link, you can donate a small amount to help me out so that I can continue to produce these trips. In the meantime, I hope that you all have a wonderful and pleasant and fulfilling week ahead of you, and I'll see you next time after I've finished exploring the village of Nunton.